Hey there, you're listening to On The Payroll, a podcast about project management, project delivery, CRM, Salesforce, best practices, all that really good stuff. In today's episode, I talked to Ricky Hofgaard, really good friend, who is also a data nerd just like myself, so we can geek out about lots of fun topics. She's the director of analytics at Salesforce and she's got loads to talk about and lots of really good tips to share with anyone looking to implement Salesforce in particular using analytics and wanting to use data correctly. I invite you to listen in on our conversation and I really hope that you enjoy this episode. Thanks for listening. Ricky, welcome to my Thanks. podcast. It's called On the Payroll, where we look at um, software project delivery and how we can help make things better in the rollout of Salesforce or Microsoft, things like this. How are you today? I'm, do- I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a really interesting subject. I don't think it's been covered a whole lot in the, the community, so it's really interesting to see what everybody has been saying once you go live with this podcast. Thank you. I know you are a quite a well-known name in the Salesforce ecosystem with your data tribe. I'd like uh, you to tell us a little bit about your journey, how you started to where you've got to today. Yeah, of course. Um, So I started right after university and ended up randomly in consulting. Um, I kind of was appealed by trying to um, get my hands dirty into a lot of different industries, a lot of different projects. And so that's why I thought in like um, that consultancy would be interesting. But I have to be honest, I didn't know a single thing about Salesforce back then. And I, I remember ending up in an interview when he started talking about Salesforce and I kind of panicked in my head because not once in the uh, job ad had it said something about Salesforce. Um, Long story short, you know, I kind of made it anyway and I got the job. And so uh, I just kind of taking it from there. But I think in every single um, project I've had, it's been key for me to keep learning and trying something new. So I've had conversations with my managers about how can I develop my skills and and learn new projects. And um, my my manager at one point realized I was good with reports and I answered quite a lot of that those questions. And so she sent me on the training for um, it was wave back then. And so that's kind of how I ended up in into uh, working with wave einstein analytics and now tableau crm um, and that's also how i work with marketing it was just kind of like i wanted to learn something new and i just digged into it and started learning and then i got the projects and yeah the ball got rolling what are the kind of things that you like about consulting and specifically around the reports and um insight and analytics so i think um Honestly, data is just the heart of everything. So whenever you are having just a core implementation of Salesforce, you focus on business processes, but at the end of the day, what you're ended up getting is just a lot of data. And how do you make sense of this data? How do you actually take all this information you're generating and convey it into something that makes sense and that you can enhance your decisions or enhance your business with and get more insight? And I think really that's um, what I really like about data and analytics and what I've then come to learn later because in the beginning, of course, I was just working a lot with the standard operational reports we have in, in Core Salesforce. And what I came to learn later when I started working with Wave, Einstein Analytics, Tableau CRM, let's just call it Tableau CRM going forward. But when I started working with that, what I thought was really interesting was the whole data modeling side. 
and that you can't just take data as it is. You have to think about how do you structure this data so you can actually get an output that is relevant for you. Mm -hmm. And lately, one of the things that I've been looking into is AI and machine learning. And what I find interesting is the data structure that you have for that and the way that you're um, is just modeling and filtering your data is completely different from when you're trying to get dashboards and reports. And so that whole mindset just fascinates me that it's more than just pretty gra graphs. It's actually understanding the business. It is understanding the data. It is being creative as well. So it kind of have everything for me. Okay. So I'm, I used to be a DBA with Microsoft and SQL. And I find myself, so I, like you, I love data. I love uh, the relationships between data. Mm -hmm. And I find myself walking around and I just have ERDs in my head. Like, yep. how am I related to you? How is that business related to this other business? And how is it providing services to me? Do you find yourself thinking that way? Oh, all the time. Um... And it's not even just in work wise. I think a lot of people just consider me a little bit of a data nerd because uh, <laughs> so actually I go boxing every um, week, twice a week. And I've even gone so far that I've now gotten these um, trackers on my wrist so I can I can actually measure my my speed and my um, the power of my punches and the type of punches that I'm doing. And so, of course, the data nerd that I am got this what before I bought it, by the way, I, I needed to make my investigation clear. Can I get access to this data? Meaning, can I get it out in a CSV format so I can actually put it into um, a Tableau CRM and start like looking at my data? Okay. And I kind of do that with everything um, with my um yeah, everything that I, I try to work with, I see a way of, of can I measure this in some way and I, can I start tracking it? And I guess I've just always been that way. I find it fascinating to see a result over time and also see how can you improve both on a professional matter and a personal, but yeah, definitely see data opportunities everywhere and try and answer questions everywhere in terms of data. Um, so here, here's a cheeky question based on yeah. what you just said. So what's the pattern have you found with regards to your boxing and your performance? What have you found with the data that you've seen? So actually I found that it's pretty consistent, but what I'm also realizing is uh, Mondays tend to be, so I box Monday and Thursday and Monday tend to be slower than when I am boxing on Thursdays. And so I had a discussion with my trainer uh, recently where I was like, I think it's because I haven't had anything aggravating me during the week. So I, I kind of need to have that aggression <laughs> to, to really push, um, push forward and, 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 you know, make faster and more powerful punches. And so, um, yeah, I think just after the weekend, you just completely relaxed and you haven't really dealt with anything yet. So I don't know. <laughs> that is such a super fun uh, fact. Um, okay. I, I could take this conversation right down to analytics and how the world is like with the Internet of Things and so on and so forth. But maybe for another session, of for today's session, I'd like to focus a little bit more on Salesforce projects in general. Um, and I, I, I did have some questions, but I like how this is flowing. So let me ask you with regards to Salesforce projects, which are very heavily focused on analytics. What are the key things that organizations should think about? Let's say if they come to a point in their uh, business where they think, I have so much information Sorry, that's it. I have so much data right now in various systems. I would really like to get very key insight into my customers, into the ways of how we work and how we can improve. What are some of the things that they need to think about at that point before even embarking on a big analytic type project? Yeah, so it's a it's a really interesting question and i think a lot of people ask themselves that too late i think analytics is not something 
all, at least not all the projects that I've been involved in or customers I've, I've seen in my consulting career, it's not something that they consider upfront, how do we want to use this data? A lot of the times they're just uh, replicating the process that they already have and assuming it's still going to work. And sometimes that's fine, but I think you really need to start thinking about a data strategy and ask yourself, why am I actually in need of these this piece of information. So in the beginning, you might not collect any kind of information about your customers in terms of what describes these customers. And so you want to start doing some trending analytics down the line and you don't have this information about, you know, uh, what country are they in, basic example, right? And you then have to, on the back end, start figuring out and, and filling out this all this data, which can become quite time consuming. And then you start having patchy and, and not really good quality of data, which then comes to another issue around when you start reporting, how does actually this data look? And then also if you start doing machine learning, it's going to become even more difficult. So I think one of the things I always uh, suggested in, in the implementations I did was think about the data strategy what kind of things do you want to report and what is it that is relevant for you to know and make sure that you capture this data. But also it shouldn't really be a hindrance either. You shouldn't put in too many fields because we all know that, you know, if, if everything is mandatory, you just don't fill out anything. But at the same time, if you don't make anything mandatory, it's, you know, you're going to get a bad quality of data. So I think it's about also thinking, well, when you're first creating an account, for instance, there are certain things of information you will have. But when you're getting to a per, uh, to the stage of creating a, a opportunity or an order or however you work, then I'm sure that you know the customer a lot better. And then you might need to fill in more information at that point in time. So I think about just the data strategy of, of how are you, what are you going to use this data for, but also how are you going to collect it becomes really important. And then I think another thing is not every piece of information has to be in Salesforce. I mean, typically a lot of um, um, consultants will start saying, oh, but we could put this in, into Salesforce. And, you know, while we can, it may not always be the best way to do it. Uh, sometimes you already have a well-established process or there are dependency integrations that legal legislations that basically means that you can't put it into the same system and um, you have to be aware of that but that doesn't mean you can't get access to this data for instance with Tableau uh, CRM what we can do is we can have these different connectors so you can push the data sin sets in directly and you can create your dashboard and we can embed them directly into an account page. So when you're looking at your account, you don't necessarily just have to have the Salesforce data. Mm. You can enrich it with any data, but make it relevant for that account um, and then embed it directly in. Just a very quick question on that. Yeah. You can embed that, but you wouldn't be able to search on it because it's not within Salesforce or can you still do it? Well, I mean, what we're doing is in Tableau CRM, we have our own data store. We just don't follow the the, the regular Salesforce okay. relational database with different objects. We just have a different data source. So you're pushing the data in, but we're going against, against different limits. So typically in Salesforce core objects, you're looking at how um, uh, how much data storage you can use there. And if you're not having a lot of users, you might hit quickly uh, hit those limits, especially when you talk about transactional data. Uh, but in Tableau CRM, what we can actually do is we have data sets, but you can have up to 10 billion rows of data and you can also wow. purchase more. So it's a different kind of uh, data landscape that we're, we're looking at. As soon as the data is there, you can filter it as, as much as you want. Uh, if you've ever interacted with the Tableau CRM uh, dashboards, you click on something and everything reacts to that um, selection that you've done. Um, and we call that faceting. And that's really the power that you can start drilling down into your data and, and not just look at static graphs that we typically have with uh, operational dashboards. 
I can see that you're so passionate about data. I'm, I'm kind of getting the vibe as well. Let's uh, take the conversation a little bit wider and talk about projects in general and yeah. in your career and the kind of projects that you've been on. Uh, feel free to you know, narrow it down to data and analytics if you like, because that's <laughs> my jam as well. But tell me about the kind of projects that you have found really enjoyable I'll go to the, the other side one a bit later. But the, the, the projects that are really enjoyable to you, what are the themes that you can draw from that? What what made them great to work on and yeah. light your fire? So I don't think we necessarily have to talk about data here, to be honest. I think, um, as I said earlier, anything that is driving me is where I get the ability to learn. So I don't want to get completely out of my comfort zone where you just on deep water and don't know how to, <laughs> to reach land. Um, but where you're pushing your own uh, boundaries of your knowledge and your skills, and it can be in terms of um, uh, products. So, you know, working with Pardot, uh, Wave back in the day, uh, working on a marketing cloud or even things in Salesforce that I haven't done, communities or something like that. I think that's where I'm, I'm, I'm really interested because I'm gaining new skills. I'm trying something out that I haven't done before. And uh, the other thing that I, I really appreciate with a project and make it even more enjoyable actually comes down to the collaboration you have with the client. Um, because I find a lot of the times as a partner, what we ended up being is that sole responsibility of delivering a project. But when it comes down to it, a partner is only delivering the project. But who's who is taking this and taking it yep. further? Because when you're looking at data, when you're looking at even just the, the maintenance of your Salesforce org, the job is not done when the partner leaves. Somebody mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. to take this over. Somebody has to keep developing it. And I think the best project and most enjoyable project is that combination of me learning something new, like like um, adding to my skill set, but it's also having a great partnership with the customer where you don't actually see, oh, this is the customer and we're the par partner, but it's that um, collaboration between the two when you take joint ownership of the project that's really where i find the most uh or the best project that i've worked on um since mm -hmm. Ab absolutely i totally agree um okay so on the other side, <laughs> other side yeah. those character building projects you've already pulled out one item which is if you get dropped in a deep end with no support and out of your comfort zone maybe be asked to do something that you've never been done or you don't have the capability of doing. So that doesn't make it enjoyable for anyone. It's a sink or swim situation. You might swim, but that could leave scars uh, and pain that, that kind of comes up later on and manifests in a different way, like anxiety, for example. Um, so that's one. What are the kind of character building projects you've been on and why have they been tough for you? I think, you know, you're spot on saying when you're put into the deep water and you have absolutely no idea how to to solve it, that's been, I've been on a few of those and that's really not comfortable. And I, I think everybody can agree on that. I think the other one is also looking at when you just don't have a good collaboration with project managers with the customer there's that blame going on oh we wanted this we didn't get this you're you're at fault uh where in reality maybe you're to to blame for some of it but it may also be because you have dependency with the client and now everybody's just pointing fingers and i think that whole scenario just demands some really difficult conversations uh, sometimes you have it with your pro uh, project manager. Sometimes I've had to have them myself directly with the customer. And uh, it's never fun having those kind of co uh, conversations because it's an art of not being defensive and understanding where people are coming from. But at the same time, 
you don't want to take the whole blame because yeah. again, it is a team effort, right? And sometimes I also just find it really annoying, if I'm honest, <laughs> that I have to focus on what went wrong. Why not just look at what is the issue now and how can we move forward? I really often, I don't see a, a whole point in dwelling in what happened. It happened. Let's not blame anybody because it doesn't matter now. We just have a situation we have to deal with. And um, yeah, those conversations can be quite difficult to have, I think. Yeah. So you're talking about the project itself that may not have been handled properly, potentially from the start. So if you say there's yeah. a blame game issue, then there might be a situation where expectations are not aligned properly. Customer is thinking they're getting something and what we're thinking we're building something else yeah does that sound about right yeah yeah i mean it's it's the sometimes it comes down to you know it's being sold and you come in after it's been sold and then you listen to the requirement and you're like well that doesn't really match up how am i gonna work with those hours uh to make that happen or maybe even there's constraints i had a situation where it basically boiled down to them wanting two-way two integration, but the system integrator that we had to work with, or like the other system we had to work with, was only allowing us to do one-way integration. So I'm like standing there saying, saying, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> because if I can't do uh, two-way integration, and that's but that's what you want, I really can't do my job. And so those are really difficult conversations to have, but it can also be further down the line, something unexpected happens and you just have to deal with it. Maybe, you know, uh, you're losing a, a team member that is being allocated to a different project. Maybe you don't have the right resource at the right time. Uh, there are so many different uh, scenarios that can happen in a, a project. I know, you know, you must have experienced it as well. And the pain and the joy of it. Um, yeah. So from, from my point of view, as a project manager, this all falls on my shoulders. When things go wrong, it's up to me to fix it because the team members should really focus on what you're good at. The data side or the marketing side, whatever that might be and all those, um, it's for me to deal with. In your, in your career, have you, what, have you had good project um well sorry i can answer that you've had <laughs> both good and bad project managers right yeah. in, in, in yeah. your project of course draw draw me some bullet points of what makes a good project manager that you would work with again and obviously contrast it with somebody who may have left you to pick up the blame and to deal with dealing with issues when it should have been there well, I think you're spot on because um, you're saying it, you know, as a project manager, that is your responsibility. I think the problem is sometimes the reality is a project manager doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily allocated full time to one project, right? So especially when you're dealing with small, a lot of smaller projects. So you might have one project manager that has I don't know, let's just make it crazy and say they have five, six projects at the same time. And so there is going to be times where they're not going to be able to be hands on. So I think those situations are, um, I don't know if you can actually do anything about it. It just happens. And I think that's where you need to have strong consultants that are able to pick up the slack. And that doesn't mean they have to do everything, but having those difficult conversations mm -hmm. uh, is definitely something where you can you can add into it. But what it just to answer your question around, so what makes a good pro project manager? I think what I really enjoy is where I sit back and I don't have to focus about the planning. So the, the project manager for me is really one that sets up the whole framework and I can focus on what I'm good at, which is the technical side. And then I let you know, whenever I have any issues, I can escalate. I have, you know, that framework to work within. But I also appreciate when a uh, project manager can go in and 
push back on the client. I appreciate a project manager that can go in and have technical conversations with the client. I'm not expecting them to be, you know, as technical as me. That's not the point. But if you are coming to me and say, hey, what's the status on this requirement? And I give you an update that's going to have some technical elements to it. And it's always helpful for me if you understand, you know, what is a Salesforce object? What is, you know, process builder? Or what's it, what is, you know, Apex? Not that you have to be able to create it and deliver it, but understand the concepts because that's going to make my communication with you a lot easier. And you can take the communication then with the client. Of course, if there's a deep dive, you know, you can always bring in the right people. Um, but I think that for me is really something that is helpful. So what you're saying is that you appreciate a project manager who actually manages the project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you also touched... silly, but yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. I can, I can see where you're coming from. And also you're touching on a point where a project manager is a lot more effective when they have some domain knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, because I've had uh, situations where we had brand new project managers and, and they've dealt with IT projects before. So it's not that they're not skilled, but having to educate them on um, Salesforce and just the fact that you may have, you know, three releases uh, every year means that there are certain ways that you want to address um, things. You don't want to over customize things that are standard in within the project. Um, and, and just having those kind of discussions is just a lot easier when people have that dom dom domain knowledge. Fantastic. Thank you. So just going back to your career history, mostly in consulting mm -hmm. with consulting partners, and now you work for Salesforce. Yes. who is the SaaS provider. How are they different in, in the way they're working and the way that you interface with customers? How is it different? And, and you know, just paint a picture. Right? Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't really do any kind of hands-on building anymore. So that's the major, I guess, the major thing. So just to paint it a little bit more clear, I actually work on the product uh, product side and not on the sales side. So I don't do any demo building. Mostly what I do is advisement on how to um, utilize your Tableau CRM uh, the best way, um, you know, help out if you have any performance issues or whatever it may be. So, so that's more what I do now. Now, I think the major difference that I found beside the fact that my job is really not the same anymore in terms of building, I think that the major thing that I find different is, as I said before, I've always tried in my project to keep learning and keep doing something new. So I remember being a first mover on Pardot. I remember being a first mover on Marketing Cloud. I remember being a first mover on Wave. Um, and just within my company, I, of course, there's a lot of people <laughs> that are moved into these products, but I was one of the first people in my company to actually work with these things. And what that also meant was I was the expert, right? So whenever there were any kind of issues, I was the person that people went to, but I was also the person that was sitting with my own difficult issues or challenges and had to figure out um, a way. And if we look at, at when Wave came about, uh, back then there was absolutely no documentation. Well, there were, but there wasn't the fact that when you're Googling, you find mm -hmm. a lot of different things um, on, I don't know, workflows or whatever formula fields or whatever you would do in, in, in core Salesforce. But when I did it for Wave, I just, it came up with very limited results, if any. So I had nobody to discuss anything with. And that's actually why I started my blog as well. It's because I was like, okay, I need to document my knowledge. If I have the issue, I'm sure other people have as well. Um, but yeah, so I think the major difference is now being part of the product team at, um, at Tableau CRM, there is always somebody to ask. And the team that I'm part of 
we are um, all focused on Tableau CRM, all focused on Tableau CRM implementations, performance. And so there's all but always somebody to ask. And I really love that, that I'm not the, the, the single expert in the team. Um, I don't have to know everything. I don't have to figure out by my myself trial and error. I can ask people. And that's, that's really the major difference. I, I, I think. In the, when you were working with a consulting partner and we were talking about what makes a great project and you're talking about the buzz between learning something brand new and the collaboration with the client to address a certain business problem to complete mm -hmm. the project. Are you finding the same buzz in your current role? So you are still learning. So that gets a tick box, but it's a different way of working now. So you're not interfacing directly with client apart from being the advisory. Are you still getting the other side of? Yeah, I think so because I might not be doing the hands-on building anymore. Um, and that's not true because sometimes I have to test things out by myself. So I'll do it in my little demo work and, and try something out. Um, but I think it, it's kind of like, it's the same thing when I started out with, with core Salesforce in the beginning, I was doing so many different fields and building. I was like, oh, that was actually fun. Just creating fields. And then you kind of built, I don't know, hundreds of fields and you get to a point of like, okay, I've done this. I know how to create a field formula be it look up, it doesn't matter, I've done it. And and so you kind of just find new things, uh, new difficult issues uh, to deal with. And I think it's the same thing in, in my job now that I might not do the hands-on building, but I still deal with customers and we're still looking at um, how, for instance, to optimize data flows. And so I still have to look at data flows and, and figure out how have they done it and what can we actually do to, imp uh, to improve it. So there's still that problem solving and I'm still being challenged because not every single customer's data is the same. Where business processes, I'm sorry to say, a lot of the time they are quite similar, mm -hmm. but data and the way that you are using this, this data can be quite different. Of course, there are things which is also why we have templated um, dashboards um, that are the same for every business. But when you then start looking at external data that you're pulling in, um, you can't just look at it the same way all every time. Uh, so I still get that, you know, challenge. Do you have a team that you work with now at the moment? Yeah, so we are a, um, well, I mean, if you look at the, the closer team, um, we in the analytic sense of excellence, I think we're maybe 16 people, um, but we're all global. Uh, I think I'm the, I, I am the only one in the UK. So we have um, uh, one other person in Europe, then we have some people in India and we have some people in America. Oh, there's a couple of ways I can take that question. So let me <laughs> take the first one. Um, in your experience yeah. what do you think are the things that make a great team to work with i think it's more you know having respect for one another and your similarities but also your differences and um letting those differences um be the strength so i think um yeah just making sure that understanding that just one way is not necessarily the right way. There are so many different ways that you can you can come to a solution. And mm -hmm. I think we all bring each our own flavor. And I actually think that brainstorming is getting the best, uh, best solutions. Is there any way you can provide a small anecdote to just illustrate this when you say letting our differences be our strength? Just... Do you have an example that might come to mind how someone else's difference with you has brought out a richer and better outcome? Do you have any that come to mind? Oh man, I don't think I have anything to okay. mind. All right, let's, let's park that for now. If it comes to mind, okay. let me know. Uh, you now talk also about a global team. Whereas I think in the past, when you and I worked together, 
make positive. We had teams, we, we went in, we interfaced. And that, I think, plays a quite a big part in creating team cohesion. But now, it's global. And if you're the only one in the UK, you may or may not have met the rest of the 16 members of your team. How do you, what are the strategies that you have used to, uh, or, or that works for you in terms of trying to get to know everyone a little bit better and to create the kind of bond that makes working so much more fun? It's actually funny you're, you're saying that because um... I've recently been reading about um, culture and how different cultures interact and different classifications of cultures. And one thing that I've come to realize is we actually have every uh, month we have a social hour and I'm, I feel a little bit saying it, but it's not something that is really you know, something that is doing it for me. Like I, I feel very hard time engaging. So I was reading this book and there's just something that clicked. And I think it comes down to the fact that the way that I, I work is I'm very linear. I rely on data and I don't really rely so much in relationship in terms of generating trust. And I just by default have it in a way, if, if that makes sense. So why, why I'm saying all of this is I find it extremely difficult to small talk. And when you're not small at like when you can't really engage with the small talk, it's it's getting harder to actually get to know people. But thinking about it in a work context, that doesn't necessarily have a great value for me. That doesn't mean that I'm not valuing it at all, but it's not necessary for me to carry out my work, if that makes sense. So I think, how do I, how do I get to know people? I think it just comes slowly over time. It's not that forced small talk, but it's mm. like, you know, oh, what were you up to this weekend? Or uh, you're going on PTO. Do you have any plans? Um, and you know, or for instance, I was talking with a colleague and um, she has some, like, she's in India and, you know, she has this amazing background. I was like, oh, where are you? And she's like, oh, I'm actually in Kerala. I was like, oh my God, I've been to Kerala. And we started talking about that sort of stuff. So I think that's how I get to know people uh, from a virtual side. Of course, some people I have met in person as well, but um, purely virtual uh, I think that's slowly but surely that's how I get to know them <laughs> it sounds like it's usually a little bit more as well because it kind of cuts out a little bit of the chit chat the yeah. how have you what have you done over the weekend etc and it suits the way that you work a little bit better okay. yeah but I actually have to remind myself to engage with small talk um and there's just certain things that are easier to engage with. Um, but but yeah, I do have to remind myself, and I know it's a cultural thing, that I just tend to go straight to the point. So even when I write emails, I have to go back and just soften it up and say, oh, how are you doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, but that's just how my brain works. And and I just laugh at it now, but I'm, I'm extremely aware of it. I'm extremely aware of how it comes across. So it is something that I, I try to address for sure, but yeah. Okay, that brings us uh, kind of nicely to a part of the podcast that I'd like to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, this is called the, the You Use the Manual and it's something that I've read and where it'd be great if everyone came with the manual and said, this is how you work with me. I work very well without the chit chat or if my kids come to me, Mom, this is how I want you to work with me. More game time, less nagging. <laughs> that sort of thing. I think that would be perfect. So I'm trying to learn a little bit more about my guests just with the, the last few questions of the podcast. Uh, you've already, I think, shared quite a lot about how you think, about how you approach and how straight you are. Are there any other raw type of unfiltered truth about yourself that you can share? 
Well, I think、um, in preparation for this podcast, of course, you sent some of the questions. As I was talking to one of my friends yesterday, and she was like, "That I'm extremely hard to read," and I think it's because、um, my directness is I it just comes natural. I just go straight to the point, and I think I shared it before. I just go in and say, "Okay, what is the issue? Let's fix it. No blame. There is, you know, it's not your fault. It's not my fault. Let's just fix it." And that's kind of my attitude. And I think if I do that straight, straight up, especially if I haven't met people before, they can get intimidated or scared off, or they, you know, hard to read. But once you know me and you know how I work. Um, I guess the point is that she was also making is like she always know where 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 I am at. Like she has no、um, issues in kind of reading me once you know who I am and like how I work. But that first、um, oh. impression can sometimes be difficult. And actually, a manager once told me about it as well. And that's when I became really aware of it, and I've tried to adapt it, which is why I. And I always try and go in and soften my、uh, reply. So I'm guessing that's quite different in the UK, where "fine" does not necessarily mean "fine." And I've also had to learn this secret coded language. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> so、um, you you come from Denmark. Can you share some of the differences you found in terms of how? Communications like or any culture shock coming over to England. You know what? I actually, when I came here five years ago, I had the wrong assumption. I might have that you know I've always heard that the the British and the Danish humor is similar, so I just kind of assume we're kind of similar, right? And so I came over and I didn't really filter my directness.、Um, At all,、um, not at least compared to how it would have been in Denmark, right? So how I would engage there、uh, was was、um, exactly the same approach that I came to England with, and I、uh, will say I got into some some difficult、uh, <laughs> discussions, and and you know I you know I, I'm I'm probably to blame,、uh, but I think it's it's it really comes down to me looking at. The room and saying there's an elephant in the room. Let's address it. How do we get this elephant out? I don't care who brought it in, but let's figure out how to get it out. And what I realized was everybody thought I was saying, "Oh, you're telling me that it's my fault that the elephant is here." And I was like, "No, not at all." But I didn't realize until it really、oh. escalated. And so I think that's really my my、uh, been my most difficult. A、problem or a challenge here in in the UK, and I'm not even sure I can tell you I found a way around it.、Um, I do try to be more sensitive, but and I also try to explain to people how I work. So say, sorry, I'm saying this in a direct way. I'm I'm not meaning anything by it、uh, or anything personal about it. But there is an elephant in the room. <laughs> how can we get it out? Right. Um, so that's been my approach, but have I mastered the English way of talking? And no, I haven't. But have you found that particular approach to be more、uh, impactful or, or more effective by just saying it, saying it upfront to say I'm not. This is not what I mean. This is what I mean. Yeah,、uh, I, I think it has. But then there is the other aspect where. People get sometimes confused that I say that because when they listen to me, and this is the feedback I've some feedback I've actually gotten, is、so、when they listen to me,、um, they actually because the way I speak is not very Danish sounding,、um, they don't they don't think that I'm a foreigner, or at least not native in in in、um, in English. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. English is definitely not my native language. And sometimes people make assumptions of that and don't understand why I'm then addressing the fact that I'm actually not English or I'm not American or I'm not Canadian,、um, and they get confused and they're like, "You don't need to do that." But at the same time, I felt what it 
did when I didn't address it. Um, and so I guess you can't really win. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but for me, yeah, it has, it has, it has helped, or I think it has. Uh, again, going back to that book I actually read about culture, um, it was saying that some cultures do prefer not to be very specific. So you have to denote meaning from the words and from the, like read be, be between the lines. Um, and that's how they work best, where other, especially Western cultures, tend to prefer the very specific, uh, explicit way of saying what you're feeling, what you think. And so I don't think you can ever really win, but I think if you're just being aware of how you're being uh, perceived or at least try to observe it, I think that's going to help you quite a lot. It has, for me at least, um, interacting with cultures. Wow. Um, I think that alone could be just another podcast by itself, just dealing with... I had so many questions uh, more around working with offshore teams, for example, and how how you'd approach working with different people in your global team, but I'll save it for another. <laughs> it's, it's a big topic <laughs> and delicate too. Indeed, indeed. Uh, like I said, you know, there's so many ways that I could take this, but um, we kind of have to wrap up. But before we go, I'm just going to ask you one final question. And what I like to find out from you is what are the kind of things that you value? What are your values that is important to you? I think fairness and respect is really what it boils down to. Um, and of course, it's difficult to explain what does actually fair and respect mean because you and I can have different perceptions of that. But I think a good way of, of starting out is just treating people how you want to be treated yourself. And I think if it all it for me that really what it boils down to if you're not being fair if you're not being respectful i just i have a really hard time working with people that that don't do that and um yeah i just think that it, it causes a lot of conflicts for me uh, okay thank you so much ricky this has been such an amazingly fun podcast i could just talk to you for ages and for I, having me, Tay. I like i like the fact that your journey has incorporated a lot of things that I like as well around data, around projects. And I think that especially, I think the question around what should a company do or think about with regards to the data management strategy and at what point? And I, I think your answer to that was as early as possible. Yeah. Right. Don't and push it out. <laughs> I like that because I think it will give listeners a really good insight as to how they should approach this and how they should think about data and why it's important to them. I also like the fact that you've provided so much insight around working with a consulting partner and with Salesforce and how you approach the cultural divide in terms of ways of working and also um, from the country that we can come from. So thank you very, very much for spending the time with me today oh no worries my pleasure and thanks for having me we will have a part two at some point definitely okay. <laughs> thanks so Talk much ricky it. take care thank you cheers bye